He was born into a world that was harsh. It was violent, and he had only known anger and hatred. It was a world where only the strong survived. The weak were crushed and despised. And he tapped into his rage early on and spent most of his days expressing it both verbally and physically. He, he pretty much hated everyone. He hated the Romans because they had conquered his country, oppressed his people, uh, did despicable acts of violence towards uh, his countrymen, and, and he dreamed of the day that he could lead the rebellion that would defeat Rome and free his people. He hated the priests because they were collaborators with Rome. They, they loved their power, their prestige, their position far more than they cared about the freedom of God's people. He hated the Pharisees because they looked down and condemned men like him from their pious perches where they would lift a finger to set people free and they would condemn those that did. Honestly, he even hated his own parents because they were poor and they were weak. All that rage led him to a life of violence. At an early age, he joined up with a group of zealots who imagined that they would defeat Rome. In reality, they ambushed a few lonely soldiers and stole from the tax collectors who were traitors because they had sold their people out to Rome. It was a career path with a very short life expectancy. And he always just kind of pictured in his mind that he would die in battle fighting nobly against a Roman cohort. But it was not to be. He and a companion were uh, caught by surprise and arrested, tried, condemned to be crucified. And so that day came and it was the final opportunity for his anger to be unleashed on the public. He railed at the soldiers and, and as they prepared him for the execution, he screamed at the crowd that had gathered to watch him as he and the others were carried out to be crucified. He cursed the failed Messiah from Galilee as he was joining them in this execution. Now he'd heard about Jesus of Nazareth. He'd heard about his supposed miracles. He'd heard about his great teachings on love and forgiveness. Ha! Ah. You can't change the world with love. He knew it took strength, it took power, it took violence to really make a difference in this broken world. But even this hardened killer was taken aback at the violence done to Jesus. He was bloodied. He stumbled under the weight of the cross. Well, at least he thought, his suffering won't be long. They had scourged him to the point of death. And finally, they arrived at Golgotha. How fitting to die in a place called the skull. They were nailed to their crosses and lifted up in place. And it was then that he heard Jesus speak for the very first time when he prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. Ha! He wanted to see them burn in hell. But in the ensuing hours of agony and pain on the cross, something unexpected happened. I mean, through the pain, through the agony of a crucifixion, for the first time in his life, he saw, was it, Dignity? Truth? Nobility? Was that what it was? He watched as the religious leaders mocked Jesus. He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ, the chosen one of God. Of course, the soldiers piled on, mocking Jesus, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! Even his partner in crime joined in, cursing Jesus, crying out, Aren't you the Christ? 
Save yourself and us. Any normal man would have lashed out. His pain-filled anger fueling a, a, just a barrage of hatred spilled out on the people. But not Jesus. He just absorbed the insults, the mockery, the hatred, the humiliation like it was his purpose. And suddenly, in a moment of clarity that could only come from God, this criminal whose life had been filled with hatred and violence and anger and rage saw Jesus. He saw him for who he really was. He saw the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And suddenly, all the anger, all the hatred, all the rage just dissipated into nothing. And for the first time in his life, he knew that love was real. He knew that God was real. Immediately, he rebuked his, his partner in hatred and he said, Hey, don't you fear God? Don't, don't you fear God? We're, we're getting what we deserve. But this man is innocent. He's done nothing wrong. And then he spoke words that he had never conceived of ever saying. Jesus? Jesus? Remember me when you come into your kingdom. I mean, how crazy was that? I mean, he didn't even know what was, you know, more insane that, that you know, you ask a dying Messiah to include you in his kingdom or that a condemned, convicted, guilty murderer is asking for mercy. But it all seemed right and sane in that moment. And then this man, whose life had been fueled by hatred, heard the sweetest words this side of creation. Truly, I say to you, today, you will be with me in paradise. Today, you will be with me in paradise. His life ended that day. Just another nameless criminal on a Roman cross. But this one died with a smile on his face and a song on his lips. Because today, you will be with me in paradise. This is the fourth saying of Jesus from the cross. And it is one that is both powerful and hopeful. I invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 23. Uh, if you're using a Bible like mine, one of the ones in the seats around you, it's page 1051. I want us to look at this brief conversation uh, that took place between Jesus and this criminal. And I want us to look at the two people in the story. First of all, I want us to look at the thief and ask the question, what did he do? What did he do? I'm not talking about his past life, his mistakes, the things that he was condemned for, all that, whether he was guilty or not, doesn't really matter. I just want to look at the two things that we see on the cross that this man who's dying next to Jesus does. The first thing that this man does is he recognized and confessed his sin. He recognized and confessed his sin. Look, begin at verse 39 in the story. You know that Jesus has already been crucified. He's already prayed. Uh, people are mocking him. They have the inscription, King of the Jews. And this is where the story picks up. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at Jesus saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, Do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. The thief recognized and confessed his sin. 
Now, you would think that would be easy. I mean, he's being executed for murder. Okay, he's, he's being executed because he's a, an enemy of Rome. He's, uh, you know, taking people's lives. He's, he's been a, a bad guy. And, and in the process of execution, you think, hey, go ahead and admit you're guilty. But here's what I found is that we don't really like to confess our sins. None of us do. In fact, if you've ever spent any time in jail as a uh, guest or as a, uh, you know, someone visiting the guests there, what you find is that jails are filled with what? Innocent people. <laughs> Ask them, they will tell you. They didn't do it. They were framed. It's a setup. They, you know, it, it's not true. Jails are, the place that you think it would be the easiest to confess your wrongs, uh, no, people are still denying it. Because none of us like to confess our sins. Most of us really are lifelong experts in denial. It's not our fault. If you understood, uh, you know, we excuse our behaviors. Now, now don't, don't get, get me wrong. We, we understand what sin is because we're quick to point it out in other people. We see their faults really clearly. We see their failings really clearly. But, but we excuse our own, right? Well, yes, I know that's wrong, but... I hear that all the time. I know that's wrong. I know I shouldn't be doing this, but... And then we come up with some reason why for us it's okay. It's not okay for everybody else, but for us, we'll, we'll let ourselves slide. And by the way, this is a, a great indicator of where you are in your relationship with Jesus because uh, that whole denial thing, it's a sign of religion versus a relationship with Christ. Religion easily identifies the faults of other people while at the same time overlooking its own sin. But when you're in relationship with Jesus, you easily admit your own faults. Why is that? Why do I say that's an indicator? Because when you're close to Jesus, you can't deny your sin. When you when you're close to Jesus, you can't deny your sin. That thief was just a few feet away from Jesus. He's a few feet away as he's watching the Son of God die on the cross, as he's listening in to the conversation of grace and forgiveness, as he sees the holiness on display that is taking on the sin of the world, and, and he becomes aware of his own faults, his own sin, his own failings. Because when you're close to Jesus, everything that you've done wrong becomes crystal clear. Think about this. When you are close to Jesus in relationship, you become aware of your sin, of your rebellion, of your failings, of your evil desires. They become crystal clear because the light of Jesus' holiness shines on our filth and we see it for what it is. That, that's reality. The closer you are to Jesus, the more aware of your sin and failure and evil desires you become, which is the problem with religion. Because religion likes to cover up our sin, our failure, our shortcomings. Likes to pretend we don't have evil desires. Religion works hard at saying I'm not guilty. Uh, and relationship says I am guilty. I spent a lot of years in uh, growing up in churches. And, uh, and Jesus was preached and taught and loved, I'm sure. But uh, at the same time, uh, nobody ever really talked about their struggles. And so I grew up as somebody who loved Jesus. I was a young man when I surrendered and said, I'm going to serve God in ministry. And I thought there was something wrong with me because I was fighting with pride and I was fighting with lust and I was fighting with gluttony and I was fighting with all these sins that are out there and nobody else seemed to be admitting that they were struggling. They all seemed like they had it all together. Their lives are, are, you know, good, and they're holy, and they're righteous, and they're not talking about their evil thoughts and evil desires that filled my life. And I went, what is wrong with me? And what I really discovered was that we're all a bunch of liars. That's what it boils down to. It's evidence of religion, because religion, we want to look good. We want to celebrate our goodness. Talk about what good people they are. We're good people. They're not good people. We're good people. You know when it shows up the most? Go to a funeral sometime. Funeral must be the place where we all practice our lying. They were such a good man. He was a good man. She was a great lady. Good, great. And, and uh, 1 John 1.8 says this. 
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Wow. John, one of the disciples, one of the apostles who walked with Jesus, who who wrote the Gospel of John, says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Truth is, we all struggle. Truth is, we're all sinners. Truth is, we all fail. And, And here's the reality. The closer you get to Jesus, the more you become aware of those failures. The more you become aware of those sins, the more you become aware of the rebellion. The more you become aware of the evil desires that are in your heart, that are in your mind, that are there. And so you can pretend you don't have them, but the Word of God says you're deceiving yourselves and you're far from the truth. So you can proclaim your goodness, me. I'm going to join with that thief. I'm going to recognize and repent of my sin. That's what he did. He recognized and confessed his sin. And then he asked Jesus for mercy. Verse 42. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. A a simple request that I want to be included. Is there a place for me? In your kingdom. And Jesus amazingly, wonderfully said, yes, there is. Now think about this. This is incredible. Jesus offers mercy to a criminal who has no chance to serve him, praise him, or honor him in this world. Let that sink in for a moment. You want a picture of grace? This is it. This man can do nothing to advance the kingdom of God, to serve Jesus, to honor Jesus, to praise Jesus in this world. All he can do is die with a different attitude. That's it. But he asks for mercy, and mercy is given to him. And and I want you to know that mercy is available to you. I think this thief in his story in the conversation is for us so that we will understand how incredible and how amazing is the grace of God that is offered to us. Mercy is available to you if you ask for it. God's not going to run out of it. It's available. Again, this thief it points out, it doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done, uh, how you've rebelled, how you've defied God, God is still waiting to pour out his grace, his mercy on you if you ask him for it. If you ask him for it. 1 John 1, 9. You know, the, the verse right after that says, uh, if we say we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous and will forgive us our sins and purify us of all unrighteousness. That's the mercy that is available to you. Jesus' sacrifice for sin was enough to cover your sin. All of it. So mercy is always available with this one caveat. Mercy is available in this life. While you still draw breath, mercy is available to you. The thief on the cross, he asked for mercy, he received mercy. Now it's important for you to understand that because if you ask Jesus for mercy, he'll give it. There's no substitute, no other option, but you got to do it before you leave this world. So some of you in this room need to confess today. You need to ask Jesus for mercy today. You've been thinking about it. You've been hanging around the edges of it. You've been coming to church. You've been being religious. You want to be a good person. You're trying really hard to to change your life, and it doesn't work that way. The way it happens is you say, Jesus, I can't do this without you. I need you. You're my king. You're my Lord forever. I, I confess you as Savior and Lord, and I need you to change my life. And there's some of you who who need to stop trying so hard to be a good person and let Jesus change you. But it only happens when you ask him for that mercy. It doesn't happen because you try harder. And and it breaks my heart that that some of you are listening to this and you'll still walk out of here and think, I got to try harder. Look, we we don't do good stuff so that God will like us. We don't do good stuff so that God will save us. We do good deeds, we serve people, we love people because God has loved us and he's changed our lives. The way we get to heaven is only by asking Jesus for mercy. Please know that. 
And if you need to take that step today, then, then leap into the mercy of God. Even if you don't understand it all, even if you find it hard to believe, just go ahead and take that step. Let God show himself to be real to you. Now, there's another group in here that you've already said yes to Jesus. You've already kind of said, you know what, I, I, I want to follow Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I need Jesus to save me. And, and you've taken that step, and God has become real to you, and yet you've never publicly declared your faith in baptism. And, and the thief is a great example because he was never baptized, and he still got to go to paradise with Jesus, so that's cool. And, and yes, baptism doesn't save you. We talk about that all the time. It does not convey salvation to you because you get in the water and get wet. What is baptism then? It's our declaration to the world that we love Jesus and he's our Lord. And there's some of you that you've said, I love Jesus and he's my Lord, but you've never gotten baptized. And you're like, yeah, it's no big deal. Yeah, it's kind of like getting engaged and never getting married. Hey, I love you. Let's get married. Okay, when? I don't know. Someday. Maybe we'll get around to it. What is marriage? Marriage is the public declaration that this, is, this union is forever. That it's real. And some of you have been flirting with Jesus for a long time. And you're wondering why there's no power in your life and why you're not experiencing things and, and it's because it's obedience and you just need to go ahead and say, hey, I'm going to get serious about this Jesus thing. I'm going to follow him and, and I'm going to declare that to the world. So the thief, all he did was he recognized and confessed his sin. He asked Jesus for mercy. We see the thief and we see Jesus. And in Jesus we see the promise of paradise. Hope beyond this world. Hope beyond this life. What does he say? Truly I say to you today you will be with me in paradise. I mean, Jesus gives us the hope that fills us and sustains us through tragedy and sorrow and pain and loss. Now, without getting into it, there's all kinds of theological controversies and discussions and debates about heaven and paradise and what happens when we die, and I'm not going to get into all that. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Here's my, here's my how I understand Scripture. Here's my biblical you know, hermeneutic, my, my principle for how I interpret things. I start with Jesus, and I go with the clearest statements first. So here's the clearest statement that you're ever going to get on what happens when we die. Uh, Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. So I want to look at this passage. I want to look at that statement. I want to break it down so that we're clear about some things, and I'll leave some stuff unanswered because I can't answer it. First thing Jesus said is, today. Today, not some distant future, not eventually, but today, a few hours from now, when you draw your last breath here, we're going to be hanging out in paradise. Today. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So I, I kind of take Jesus at his word. When uh, you breathe your last in this world, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're going to wake up in heaven. I, I, I'm good with that. That's kind of what I, what I believe because I take Jesus at his word. Today you're going to be with me in paradise. Second thing I want to look at. talks about paradise. Now, the Bible tells us clearly that at the end of all things, when, when God concludes this world as we understand it, that he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. It's de described in Revelation 21, 22, uh, what, you know, at the, at the very end of all the stuff. Second um, Peter 3 says he's going to like burn this you know, broken, corrupted creation up and he's going to start over again. And those of us who are followers of Christ get to experience that, get to be a part of that. But until that day, we get paradise. We get heaven. The Apostle John describes this this throne room of God in Revelation 4 and 5. you got to go home and read it. It'll cheer you up. It is exciting to see what's going on in heaven today. And, and it's like, wow, this is cool. Uh, and, and so just think about this. Given the option between paradise and hell, which one do you want? <laughs> you guys aren't very loud. I'm not so sure what you want. <laughs> kind of scare me, man. We need to go back to the whole mercy thing. <laughs> Choice between paradise and hell. What do you want? Yeah, okay, well, you know, you don't even have to tell me. I'll choose the choice between paradise and bows. I'll take paradise, you know. Um, look, I'm just going to take paradise because that doesn't sound like a lose scenario at all. So that's just it. We get paradise. We get sinless perfection. That's what the world was uh, when God created it originally, Garden of Eden, all that kind of stuff. Now, I cannot tell you exactly what it's going to be like. 
I cannot tell you exactly what we're going to look like. I've had people say, well, you know, in heaven, do I get to be tall and thin? You realize that uh, our constructs for beauty in our culture are influenced by a broken and sinful world, right? So no, I can't promise you in heaven you'll be tall and thin. I think, in my twisted mind, that it'd be really humorous if in heaven everybody was four feet tall and 300 pounds. <laughs> Maybe God's perfect shape is a bowling ball. <laughs> and so we all get to be short and squatty, you know, when we get there. You won't care. But I don't know what we're going to look like. I don't know what we're going to be doing. But here's what I do know. Heaven, paradise, whatever you're going to call it, is going to be more beautiful, more wonderful, more amazing than anything you can even imagine. Here's an exercise just to, just to think about. What is the most beautiful, most amazing place you have ever been in this world? I'm not talking about seen on TV or in a magazine or you know, some airbrush photo. What's the most beautiful place you have ever physically visited and you go, that is the, that's the most beautiful place I've ever been? Okay, you got that place in your mind? Good, tell the person next to you where that is. You know, I, I just got to say, three services, this is like the worst reaction to any question I've ever asked. <laughs> and all I can think is, you guys really need to get out more. <laughs> so, you know, the preacher said, take a trip, see someplace beautiful. Okay, you got that place in your mind. You, the be most beautiful place you've ever been. For me, you know, uh, hands down, it's Hawaii. You know, there's places where everywhere you look, it's just beautiful in all directions. And, and so I think about that, and then here's what I know about heaven. The ugliest place in heaven is more beautiful than the best place in this world. Think about that. The ugliest place in heaven is more amazing, more wonderful than the most beautiful place you've ever been. That's paradise. So Jesus said, today, paradise, and he said, you're going to be with me. Now, this is really the clincher. Truth is, I don't care what paradise looks like or what we do in heaven or any of that. I know that I want to be with Jesus. Jesus is the one who saved me from my sins. He died for my sins. He rescued me from hell. I want to be with Jesus. And that was Jesus' promise to a thief on a cross who asked for mercy. And that is Jesus' promise to you if you ask him for mercy. Let that truth just kind of sink into your soul. If you ask for mercy, God will give it to you. Like the thief on the cross, have you had that incredible life-changing moment of mercy in your life? I want you to have experienced that. And then, let this reality change your life. That Jesus has promised to take you with, to be with him in paradise. And if you're a follower of Christ, nothing can change that. And if you believe that, it'll change your attitude. It'll change how you see your situation, how you see your struggles, how you see the pain that you're in. It'll give you a new perspective, and it will allow you to live life with boldness and, and, and love because you know that Jesus has promised this. So I pray today that you personally, like this criminal that we read about in Luke, that you have had that conversation of grace with Jesus. Let's pray.